We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Nick Barris here. We are talking about outer space. We're talking about the Webb Telescope. We're about to show you some of the latest spectacular images with uh, Billy Teets. He's the director of the Di Dyer Observatory, and certainly he, along with others in his field across the world, are uh, watching very closely what's coming back from Webb. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Billy. What do you say? Uh, we're going to take some calls and get into more details, but can you show us some of the images right off the top here? We probably should have done this last segment because that really is what tells the story. What do you got for us? Yeah, I'd be happy to show you a few images. Give me one second to, sure. to switch over here. Yeah, that's fine. Take your time. Oh, wow. I've seen this one. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so this is one of, or this was the first image that was publicly released. Uh, actually, President Biden got to, to release that. Um, so this is a view of a galaxy cluster. Um, and it is actually the deepest infrared view of the cosmos, or in other words, uh, in infrared light, this picture shows us the farthest extents of the universe that we have seen in infrared. So um, the things that you're going to see in here, um, let, me, uh, let me zoom in just yeah, a little bit here. So are, all those, are those stars uh, or are those galaxies that, uh, that so are clusters of planets the, and stars? So the objects that you see here that... Um, have these spikes on them yeah those are individual stars in our galaxy they it, for lack of a better phrase they photobomb the image because there's really no part of the sky that you can look at and really not see any stars from our own galaxy so the the objects with the spikes those are called diffraction spikes those are stars in our own galaxy everything else that you see in this image let me go back everything else you see in this image and there's literally thousands of objects are um, individual galaxies that have billions, hundreds of billions to even trillions of stars. Wow. Uh, one, if you if you see uh, the full resolution view of this and you just zoom in on it and just start looking around, you're going to see a lot of stuff. Uh, for example, um, you'll see that uh, there's these uh, stretched out galaxies here. Normally a galaxy, if you see where my mouse is, yeah. normally we would think about a galaxy kind of looking like that one. Yeah. I'm not worrying about color, but um, has this nice structure to kind it. Kind of a spiral. A lot of yeah. these galaxies, yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of these galaxies you see have uh, or are kind of formed into streaks. And these are galaxies that are actually behind this cluster of central galaxies, which appear very white in the image. And the mass of that galaxy cluster, its gravity is actually bending space and time. This is something that Einstein uh -huh. predicted would happen. We've observed it many times before. Um, the advantage of this, uh, what, what's known as gravitational lensing, is that it makes these very distant galaxies that we normally wouldn't be able to see, like some of these stretched out ones. It, they, this galaxy cluster actually acts like a magnifying glass to allow us to see some of those very distant uh, galaxies. And in fact, um, these two galaxies here that are stretched and they look like they're linked together, one of the cameras on the Webb telescope, uh, which can take spectra of objects, or in other words, it breaks apart the light of these objects to look at things like chemical composition. It's found that the spectra of these two galaxies are identical, which means that we're actually seeing a double image of a single galaxy here. So it's kind of like this oh. galaxy cluster foreground is acting like a big funhouse mirror. It's magnifying, it's distorting, but ultimately it really helps us uh, because it allows us to see things that we would normally have an incredibly hard time seeing, if not uh, uh, or impossible to see before. And so when you say um, so, uh, that these are galaxies that have lots of stars, does, it, does that mean they, they have, are stars different than planets or do they also have planets? Um, so what we're finding in our own galaxy is that when we look out in just our little part of the galaxy, you know, we're not even looking halfway across our own galaxy. We're finding uh, planets around lots and lots of stars. So, so what's the difference? Yeah, what's the difference between a star and a planet? So a, a star uh, is generating its own energy. Okay. Uh, so our sun at the core. It's hot enough that it is actually uh, generating its its own energy gotcha. through fusion. Okay. And that's key here. So planets don't get big enough to 
to do that. And that's what really sets them apart from, from a star. Okay. Okay. So yeah, a lot of the stars that we're seeing in this, in this image are probably not there anymore because even the closer galaxy cluster, these wider galaxies here, uh, those are about 4.5 billion light years away. So the light we're seeing from those nearby galaxies left the light left those galaxies just as our solar system was actually forming and is just now getting here. So that's wow. really kind of mind boggling in and of itself. Are you able but to there a lot when, when, when you galaxies. break down the uh, the light, as you said, you can learn a lot, I guess, from this light as it comes in. I guess um, you know, what kind of things can you learn? Is it possible, can you get it down to the detail where you can look at light that's coming from some of these galaxies or from stars, or I don't know if it can bounce off planets, that can give you an indication whether or not there are similarities between what we're seeing there and what we have on Earth? And what I'm driving at here is, can you tell if there's any evidence of life elsewhere? Gotcha. So I'll, I'll show you two other images here. So this graph at the bottom, uh, this is showing the spectrum of one of those very distant galaxies, which appears really as a red dot in the image. Hmm. This is a galaxy that was determined to be about 13.1 billion light years away, which is now, if I'm not mistaken, the current record holder for farthest uh, galaxy that we've detected. Wow. But what we're seeing here are these little, and it may be hard to see on the screen, but there's little spikes in amongst all this yeah. wiggling line. And those spikes are signatures of different elements. So. Uh, these galaxies, even though you know they're billions of light years away, they're going to contain the same elements that we're going to find in our own galaxy, in our own solar system. And um, uh, that's just another way that Mother Nature has kind of been kind to us. It, it, um, all of this stuff is made out of this, the very same stuff that you know we're made out of. Are, are, there, are there no um, elements so that come across where you can't explain it? Do you come across something where you're like, well, look, we're matching this up against everything we know and we can't identify it? Um, we haven't run across anything like that huh. so far. Not okay. to say we won't, but um, the one of the, the basic principles of, um, of uh, astronomy and cosmology is that um, the physics that uh, we have here in our, in our lab, in our solar system, is going to be the same as we have, you know, halfway across the universe. So okay. we're, we're starting out with, with this very basic but um, very profound assumption. Now, one other thing I'll show you is uh, one of the other release images. Yeah. So this was um, also extremely exciting because <laughs> astronomers have now confirmed the existence of at least 5,000 other planets orbiting stars just in our part of the galaxy. And so, you know, our galaxy has about 300 billion stars in it. This, the planets that we're, we've detected so far are pretty much just in our little neck of the neighborhood or of the galaxy. So we've started being able to, uh, to, we've detected the presence of these planets. We've been able to image some of these planets, which they still like look like little specks of light, even with the biggest telescopes, including Webb. But as some of these planets pass in front of their stars, and if they have atmospheres, then the starlight will pass through the atmospheres of those planets and the, uh, and the starlight will be filtered just a little bit. And so you basically do a before image uh, or a before spectrum of the star before the planet gets in front and alters the, the light. And then you do an after image when the planet is in front of the star and its atmosphere is filtering the light. You look at the differences in the spectrum and that tells you the spectrum of the, the planet. And so one of the other big uh, exciting releases was this this graph here, which is not, you know, it's not uh, visually very exciting. You know, this background image is just an illustration, but um, the wiggles here and this blue fit line here, that shows us the spectrum of the planet, of the atmosphere of that planet that was orbiting that star. So it shows us that there is water vapor okay. in the atmosphere of wow. that planet shows us details that uh, the way that the spectrum is altered that there are actually clouds that are, are affecting the, the way the water vapor uh, spectrum appears. So even though we can't see those clouds, we mm -hmm. can't see the, the planet really, we can detect all of this information from the light. Now, to go back to that final question of does this indicate life? Um, as we are studying more and more of these planets, astronomers, especially astrobiologists, are going to be looking for things like um, oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet or methane. 
Oxygen is highly reactive. It likes to bind with lots and lots of things. We have a lot of oxygen in our atmosphere because of biological processes. For example, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide, which occurs in a lot of atmospheres of planets, and converts that back into oxygen. But that oxygen quickly reacts with stuff and recombines to form more carbon dioxide or whatever. Um, if uh, we look at a planet and we see that it has a lot of oxygen, then something might be going on there that's readily uh, producing that oxygen because if we turn off all life here on the earth mm -hmm. um, very quickly. Um, don't ask me about the time scale, mm -hmm. but very quickly in cosmic sense, especially um, the oxygen signature would disappear from our atmosphere. So we find things like oxygen or methane, which quickly breaks down from ultraviolet light, but is produced by biological uh, organisms. Yeah. Um, those kinds of things might make astronomers raise their eyebrows to say, hmm, this could be potentially habitable. Does it mean that there's life? No. Does yeah. it mean that there isn't life? Doesn't mean that either. So you, all you can um, do is, as you said, kind of break down the the content of the atmosphere. It's not as though the web is going to yeah. get an alien waving at the camera. <laughs> it's not going to be quite right. Yeah, be we'd awesome. be super lucky if we did. Yeah, we, yeah, well, we're, we're starting to get these little pieces of the puzzle to yeah. uh, you know start seeing if we can find sure. something that you know, like I say, might raise the eyebrow of an astrobiologist. And by the way, and we're going to take a call from James. Just so I'm clear, you said this web is about a million miles away. Now, like Mars is like 111 yes. million miles from Earth. So Webb is still pretty close to, I mean, it's still, is, is Webb, um, it's not even past Mars at this point or anything like that, right? No, it's, no. it's so the moon is about uh, a quarter million miles from us. So right. it's four times farther than the moon is. So it's still, okay. you know, right in the Earth's state. Is it going to keep Earth's moving yeah. farther out or is it going to stay in this stasis right now? Or is it, it going to continue going further and further out? No, it is designed to orbit around this, this okay. point called the L2 point. It's a gravitationally somewhat stable point. Yeah, you said the, um, that the, keeps it moving. Yeah, the gravity from Sun and Earth keep it in play. All right, hang on. We've got to take a break. But before we do that, let's take James real quick. James, good morning. Hi, James. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. What's on your mind, buddy? Dude, this is one of the coolest breakthroughs in years, man. This is a filter to filter out all the garbage, and you can zoom in on stuff like black holes. Black holes are so cool because they bend light. When you look right at it with this, you'll be able to see the light actually bending around the black hole because it's so powerful. One square inch of dirt, of mass, <laughs> is trillions of pounds. That's how that's how massive they are. One black hole weighs a lot. I mean, or the con you're right. It makes it dense. Yeah. The gravity. You know, there's the fascination there, James. Thank you. I. I think most people are fascinated by the concept of black holes. We've learned more about it. Is Webb going to help, as he said, maybe us study black holes to some degree? Uh, actually, yes. Um, now, unfortunately even though web is extremely powerful it's not going to be able to zoom in to see the black holes um there have been a couple of images released uh showing black holes in our galaxy and another galaxy but that was using several telescopes combined that effectively were the size of the earth which that's a topic for another time sure. um, but uh let me show you one other image before we go to break yeah. here this is another one of the fantastic images that was released uh, from Wed uh, called Stefan's Quintet. Hmm. So this is a group of five galaxies that are interacting. They're they're actually close to one another in space. They will likely merge together in a few billion years to form one giant galaxy. Hmm. Um, but Webb uh, snapped this image, which um, I've got a, a comparison. Here's a Hubble view. So there's Hubble versus Webb. So. Webb is showing us a little bit more of the details within these galaxies, yeah. but I'm going to zoom in on that top galaxy there. Yeah. So this is a cool. view from the Webb telescope. And one thing that you're going to notice is that um, there is, uh, you know, this, this bright center, this is the, the center of the galaxy. But what we're seeing here is uh, it's gas and dust in this, mm -hmm. in the redder view. Yeah. And you'll notice it looks like there's a jet coming down and a jet coming up through here. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call an active galaxy. This is a galaxy that has a black hole at its center that is actively gobbling up material. But black holes end up being kind of messy eaters. They, they try <laughs> to gobble up stuff, but 
as stuff is swirling around, some of it gets shot out. Wow. And Webb is, is showing us the uh, some of the details of the jets of these black holes. So, um, like I say, it's not going to be able to zoom in on the black holes, but it will be able to help us study uh, black holes in other galaxies um, and, and even our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's just fascinating. All right, th th those images are great. Yeah. Do you have some more for us in a little bit, you think? Don't pull them up yet. Yeah. we got to take yeah. a break. But I, I just love that. I, when you pull up the images and then you're able to show us, and t that's what I love. we got to do more of that for the rest of the show. Let's do it. Um, it's, yes. it's just fa it. absolutely fascinating. We'll be back with more with our guest, Billy Teets, director of Dyer Observatory, as we talk about the latest images coming back from outer space from the James Webb Space Telescope right after this.